Hello, New Testament Survey. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at the book of Acts. We're going to talk about uh, the Acts of the Apostles, as it's often called, or as uh, one of my former professors used to say, Acts of the Holy Spirit, because essentially the book focuses on the work of the Holy Spirit in the early church. Now, whereas the Gospels tell the story of Jesus Christ, um, his uh, life and ministry and preaching, birth and death, the book of Acts picks up um, following those events, and it covers um, the uh, what happened after Jesus died, uh, essentially after he was resurrected, uh, what the apostles did. Um, but let's look at some uh, prolegomena, some opening ideas here um, as far as a date. We don't know exactly when it was written. Acts 25 mentions uh, Paul's trial before Festus. Um, Festus became procurator in uh, 59 AD, uh, so he, he got his political position in 59 AD. Early Christian usage can be traced, uh, uh, the book of Acts can be traced to the mid-2nd century. So we have a beginning date of 59 AD when it's possibly written, because that's when Festus became uh, procurator. And then uh, Acts, there's record of being used in the mid-2nd century, uh, as far as lectionaries, etc., or at least quotes. So it has to be, it had to have been written between 59 AD and say 150 uh, AD. Um, you know, but more than likely it was written after 70 AD, after the fall of the temple. Um, it is believed that Acts was written after Luke, that it's a sequel to Luke's gospel. There's a lot of parallels. Um, the uh, Both books uh, are inscribed to Theophilus. In fact, uh, if I get my computer work, I'll show you some parallels from Keener's commentary. Um, but anyway, um, so if Luke was, Luke's gospel was written after 70 AD, so and Acts was written after that, so somewhere after 70 AD. Um, but if it was written after 70 AD, it seems a lot because Paul's narrative abruptly doesn't finish. Um, Paul was said to have died in the 60s AD. Um, but the story of the book of Acts, for some reason, it kind of leaves off in almost like a cliffhanger fashion, doesn't show the end of Paul. It could be a, a narrative thing, or it could be a dating thing, or it could be the writer wasn't involved in Paul's life at every point. We, we don't know. Now, as far as the author goes, the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke, most scholars believe there's some, some debate over this. But most times you'll see Luke and Acts lumped into one category as far as specialities among scholars, like Luke Acts scholar. Um, the conclusion of Luke flows well into the introduction of Acts. Uh, there's common vocabulary and style um, in both books. Both books are dedicated to this figure, Theophilus. Uh, it could be a name or it could be a title. Also, Acts 1 refers to uh, a former book, Acts 1.1. Uh, in fact, it says, I look on the right-hand side of the screen there. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote uh, all, about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. If you'll notice on the left-hand side of the screen, we have uh, early parallels in the gospel. And, and uh, this electronic source I've got pulled up is a digital copy of uh, Craig Keener, one of my former professors, his commentary, Acts, an exegetical commentary. It's four volumes as far as the commentary goes, if I'm not mistaken. I think you end up with four volumes. I only have the first volume. Uh, but the first volume in print is over a thousand pages, and that's not counting the indices and side, cited resources. Uh, that's on a CD that's separate from the printed text of volume one. So Craig's um, commentary on the book of Acts is a tome. It's, it's rather lengthy. But anyway, you see these parallels uh, on the left-hand side of the screen um, with the book of Acts. Uh, in the book of Luke, and that's some early ones. There's a lot of other parallels as well. Um, Luke Acts are only books in the New Testament that contain a narrative about the ascension of Jesus when Jesus left. Now, there's a curious issue about authorship as far as Luke goes, because there's some wee passages in the book of Acts, excuse me, uh, the passages where it seems to be the narrator's injecting his, his or herself into the story. Uh, chapter 16, verses 10 through 17, we find the we, like you know, you and I, the we passages. Uh, we traveled here, went there, we did this. Uh, Twenty, uh, chapter twenty, verses verse five through twenty-one, eighteen, has some we passages. Chapter twenty-seven, one through twenty-eight, sixteen. These we passages have led some to believe that the author was a traveling companion to Paul, 
Now, there are some differences between Acts and Paul's writings. First off, in Acts, Paul is a miracle worker and a great orator. This is very different than the epistles. But of course, there are different genres, different things. So that can be explained away. The theology of Acts lacks any mention of some of the central tenets of Pauline theology, such as, such as justification and the atoning death of Christ. Again, they're different writers, different emphases. Could be the difference why. Uh, and, a th and third thing is in Acts, Paul is not called an apostle, though Paul uses the term for himself. Um, there's differences in accounts and allusions of similar events, uh, such as Jerusalem Conference in Acts 15. Uh, Galatians has a different account of that. But some things to note about the differences. Um, first thing is Luke was not Paul, and they weren't addressing the same issues. Uh, and there are some similarities and coincidences between the two. Okay. Now, as far as organization and structure, um, there are several different ways to kind of divide up the book. One way to think about it is a geographical organization. Uh, another way is to think of it as a character-driven organization. If you'll notice on the right side of the screen, I've got a highlighted passage from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Um, this is uh, the story of essentially Jesus when he leaves his disciples. Um, and it's how the book begins. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this, this notion of geography, uh, Jerusalem being the, the, the main city in, uh, the, uh, in Judea, uh, this uh, capital of ancient Israel, if you will, um, <clears throat> which by Roman standards was still a backwater, that's where the disciples were, their central location, kind of where they've been based out of. And it kind of spreads out a concentric fashion to Judea, which is the greater country, and Samaria, the next land over, and to the ends of the earth. Almost a, a concentric type thing going on here. And uh, so that's one way to look at it. Chapters 2 through 9 deal with Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And chapters 10 through 28 deal with the uh, ends of the earth. And if you look at a map of um, Palestine in the uh, uh, ancient times, New Testament times especially, you can see this. You'll see uh, Jerusalem, then you'll see Judea, then Samaria, uh, and then the greater world. Um, so that's one way to look at the book of Acts. It kind of spreads out from there. Uh, think about it. Say I'm in Dallas, North Carolina at, at my office currently in my church. Say Dallas to Gaston County to North Carolina to United States to the end of the world. I mean, that's, that's one way to look at it. Um, and if you look at a map of the Mediterranean, you'll notice that Jerusalem is one little small dot on the right-hand side of the Mediterranean versus the whole known world, which is essentially was the Mediterranean for those uh, people in the Roman Empire. Uh, they didn't know about the new world uh, that we live in today, but, you, you know, you get the point. Now, if you look at, on the left side of the screen, this is a selection from Michael Parsons, a scholar at Baylor, who, by the way, is a Campbell University alum. Um, undergraduate. His outline of the book of Acts, um, he gives in his commentary in the Padilla series, kind of in some ways uh, lets you know a little bit about the character driven outline that some scholars give it. Chapters 1 through 12 focus on Peter's the main character and you notice here that uh, Peter's mentioned here 8 through 12. Of course there's more nuance to that but the latter half of the book chapters 13 through 28 focuses on Paul. So as we look at the book of Acts, the latter half of Acts, I'm going to mainly focus on Paul and, and talk about historical Paul to some degree. Um, but, you know, this is two ways to look at it. now. It's, it's, there's um, scholars, we conjecture, we guess what a greater overarching outline is uh, based off of main hints, themes, whatever. But we don't know exactly what was in the mind of the writer. So, again, this is scholarly conjecture and two different ways to view the same text and same issue but some things to keep in mind now as far as emphases in the book of acts there's a uh, irenic emphasis a promoting of peace uh, seeks to present koinonia to the christian community uh, here's a quote here uh, this is from uh, robert wall his acts of the apostles and in, in new interpreters bible Sur new testament survey a religious movement uh, christianity was a religious movement that lacked solidarity when it's diverse membership will be ineffective in advancing its claims. So in other words, uh, there seems to be this sense of trying to emphasize community or the Greek word koinonia in the book of Acts. And you'll find the very early parts of Acts, especially in two through nine, this notion of 
uh, even especially the early chapters, you find that Christians had all things in common in Koinonia, this fellowship. You know, they were selling their goods and they were sharing it with those in the community who had need. Um, this notion of almost like a utopia, I guess you could say, is, 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 the utopia is a little far-fetched, but uh, the, this notion of religious community, seeking of peace amongst the community is a big emphasis. And, you know, one good example, that's chapter 4, verses 23 through 5, 11, the book of Acts, this notion of irenic, this peace notion. Uh, there's also a polemical notion in the Acts. Uh, there's a word against idolatry and over accommodation to pagan religious practices and secular practices. Uh, there's several times in Paul's journeys he pumps up against idols and fortune tellers um, in the book of Acts. And one clear example is when Paul goes to uh, the religious site in Athens and he sees all these statues of all these gods. And he gives a very um, apologetic uh, word about God. And I, and I say apologetic. Apology, apologia, um, the Greek word there, it's not... Uh, I'm sorry, apology. It's apology as far as a defense of something. Um, uh, classical apologetics in Christian circles essentially been a, has been, uh, at least in this modernistic society, a rational defense of the Christian faith. Well, Paul gives a defense in his, his way of, of God amongst all these different statues, even the statue to the unknown God we find in, in the Acts of Paul encounters in, in, in Athens. Uh, third emphasis we find in the book of Acts is, an, again, an apologetic notion. Um, this is not so much the polemical against idolatry, but a defense of. Uh, and it's a defense of the fledgling Christian faith to the Greco-Roman culture. Now, Luke, uh, if Luke's writing Acts, or the, the Luke writer, or the Acts writer, um, is attempting to discuss Christianity in a favorable way. Uh, very much akin to what Josephus is doing with uh, a lot of his writings, his histories, his Jewish wars, um, etc., where he tries to present a favorable notion, Josephus does, of Judaism in Palestine to the greater Roman culture. From you know, He's writing from Rome in his later days. Um, Luke, or the, the Luke writer, the Acts writer, excuse me, uh, is trying to give a favorable notion of Christianity. Um, there's an ambivalent depiction of Rome to some degree in, in of Paul's citizenship and acts that's made uh, be uh, intended to define uh, the citizen Theophilus relations with non-Christian Roman world. Um, and, and this is one summer here. While it may be possible for a strong believer to be a good citizen, i.e. Paul, loyalty to the gospel or the church's missionary vocation must never be compromised by the obligations of citizenship. So whereas uh, Josephus was trying to defend an apologetic way uh, Judaism to Rome, um, Luke seems to be showing that um, citizenship to heaven, I guess you could say, or citizenship in the kingdom of God is bigger than citizenship to Rome, I guess you could say. Now, fourth emphasis in the book of Acts is an evangelistic emphasis. Um, this this notion of the uh, spread of the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. Uh, and in fact, I mean, this is, you get some of the first missionaries. Uh, in the book of Acts, you find the first time that Christians are called Christians um, because the gospel message is spreading beyond ancient Palestine, Judea, into this greater world, the Greco Roman world, if you will. A uh, fifth emphasis in the book of Acts is a pastoral emphasis, and it's an emphasis on community again, the caring for others, the sharing of goods, establishing of role models, such as Paul and Barnabas, uh, Paul, <laughs> that's confusing my words there, Paul and Barnabas and Peter, uh, these, these great figures in the Christian church people can look up to later. Um, and a sixth emphasis we would find in the book of Acts, or one could find in the book of Acts, is a theological emphasis, and it shows that Shows the life of the church in the real world. You know, Acts is written to correct the apocalyptic eschatology uh, of, of a church troubled by internal conflict over end time fanaticism and doubt, as one scholar puts it. Um, in other words, um, Acts gives a depiction of the day to day life of a Christian church that's not so focused on the end of the world. Uh, you get First Thessalonians, for example, uh, you know, in the, the book where, you know, there's such an emphasis on, you know, we're going to be gone. 
Uh, it's going to happen in a flash. And you get to, by the time Paul uh, wrote to the congregation again in 2 Thessalonians, we found that the people were so emphasized on happening soon, they were quitting their jobs and sitting on top of their houses and ready to go uh, type thing. Um, you know, Paul had to correct that immediacy. You got to expect it, but don't be so, you know, you got life has to go on, in other words. In fact, Paul's infamous words in uh, 2 Thessalonians that were quoted at Jamestown Colony United, and what would become in the United States is, those who will not work will not eat. In other words, life has to go on. Uh, and that's one of the things that uh, the book of Acts shows us is that the Christian life goes on in the midst of the world, the trials of the world. You know, that'll preach uh, for any good Christian. Um, this notion that we have to live the Christian life, we have to keep our eye looking to the heavens for Jesus to return and for the, you know, the, uh, for us to go to glory or, you know, whatever that, however one's eschatology may be fleshed out. Um, but we have to live life on earth. And how do you do that? Well, I mean, the book of Acts, you see the, uh, the emphasis on community. You see the emphasis on evangelism in some ways. Uh, anyway, there's my sermon for the day. Uh, one other thing about Acts is roughly one third of the document are speeches. Now, one of the things that Craig Keener talks about, he spends a great deal of time talking about this uh, in the book of Acts, is Acts in some ways is ancient historiography. And one of the key um, uh, aspects of historiography, and you look at the sources of this and look at other ancient historiographies, is these speeches. Uh, and a lot of times in speeches, you'll find a summary of the narrator's core beliefs or even in the book of Acts case, theology. Um, you know, speeches shift, uh, they, they signal movements and shifts in plot sometimes in the story, too. Um, you look at an example here in, in Peter's Pentecostal sermon um, uh, in Acts chapter 2. Uh, you find some emphases there, some core ideas, core theology of the book of Acts. Uh, and again, a lot of these speeches in ancient historia, ancient history, or historiography, excuse me, or even in the book of Acts, there is, um, it's not a verbatim quote of the speech, probably. There are some core ideas that the speaker may have said, but it's um, a recounting of the words that is uh, very um, in the spirit of what the speaker spoke. Uh, there seems to be some injection of the one of the writer's ideas, so to speak, as well in the text. Um, but it's what the speaker would have spoken. And in a lot of ways, it's a, a lot of these speeches are in historia and historiography, excuse me, in the book of Acts are literary devices, if you will. Um, now, I'm not saying that Paul didn't say some of the things that he said. They're said in the book of Acts. Well, I mean, we don't know verbatim that Jesus actually spoke the things recorded in the Gospels. There's a strong likelihood. Um, but there is at least a framing in the Gospels and a framing in the book of Acts uh, of these speeches uh, so as to um, have them serve a greater purpose in the text, a literary purpose, a theological purpose, if you will. Um, and talk about some of these great speeches, Paul's sermon to the nations at the city of Antioch, chapter 13, uh, Paul's philosophical words at the Areopagus in Athens. Are, these are all examples of missionary discourse that serve the narrator's concerns of plot and theology. Uh, Paul's farewell speech defines the type of person who should lead uh, in the young church, fitting the narrator's pastoral concern. Uh, Stephen's speech in chapter 7 is an example of conflict between Christian preaching and Jewish tradition. Um, you know, the, the split between Christianity and Judaism didn't happen until more than likely after the fall of the temple in 70 AD, maybe in the first century, depending on what scholar you talk to. There seems to be some rifts started growing if you look at Stephen's speech in chapter 7 between this Jewish tradition and the, the life of the early church. In fact, if you look at the book of Acts, you find that, you know, Peter and John, where do they, where do they go to worship? They go to the temple. So they have a Jewish worship and a Christian worship almost. Again, Christianity started out as a sect of Judaism much like uh, there were sects like the Pharisees, Sadducees, or whatever. Uh, and modern evangelical or modern Christian notions think denominations. I mean, it's not a one-for-one one apples to apples comparison. Um, but for as far as analogy goes, it works for us in the modern world is that Judaism had denominations and Christianity essentially started as a dom denomination of Judaism. But eventually there became a rift and a split. Christianity became its own beast. And a lot of this seems to occur at least in my opinion, when you start to see Christianity venture outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judea, to more a Gentile context. Now, 
essentially, you know, where does Paul go? Start off a lot of times he goes to these synagogues to preach in the book of Acts. Um, he goes to places that were familiar for him Jewish-wise. But there's Gentiles, God-fearers, and those who weren't even God-fearers, proselytes. I mean, not even proselytes started coming into the fold of Christianity. And there's tension between uh, in the book of Acts, um, uh, we find, uh, and even in uh, the Jerusalem conference, we even find it in, uh, which is Acts 15, and look over in uh, Paul's writing Galatians, there's a conference in Jerusalem where there's tension of, you know, do Jewish converts or these Christian converts, they have to follow the rules and laws of Judaism or they, can they do something different? They have to be circumcised, things like that. So we see a lot of this play out in the book of Acts. And again, remember the world of the text, world behind the text, world before the text, the notion we talked about Raymond Brown in one of the earlier lectures is that we're reading a, a document that was written, um, you know, a good 30, 40 years maybe after the event, time the events actually happened. Um, so we're getting not only a recounting of the time of the, of the events, but we're getting some interjections of what was going on in the life of the, uh, of the text, the life of the writer at the time that it was written. Uh, again, I go back to this parallel between um, the uh, Crucible, the Arthur Miller uh, play, The Crucible. Uh, the Crucible was set in colonial or yeah, colonial, uh, America and, and the Salem Witch Trials, but Arthur Miller wrote it more as a commentary on the Red Scare in the 1950s than more so than he did on a commentary on colonial America. So some things to keep in mind, what's going on in the life of the writer, uh, not, and it's something we have to keep in view, and again, of course, we always have to keep in mind what's going on in our lives as we read the text. Um, another thing to think about uh, as far as introductory material in the book of Acts is intertextuality, um, and quotes, um, the book of Acts uses a lot of Septuagint quotations or allusions. Uh, it's not a quotation of the, the Hebrew text, more so is more than likely the Septuagint text, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, uh, Peter's uh, Pentecostal sermon in chapter 2 alludes a lot to Joel and a lot of these Old Testament texts. So if Acts and Luke are written by this, this Luke person who was possibly a physician. Uh, there's been debate over that. Um, at least a learned person. His, and he was a Gentile more than likely, then his language, uh, if he's from the eastern part of the Roman Empire, his native language more than likely would have been Greek. So it would been more natural for him to read the Septuagint as opposed to the, the Hebrew text of the Bible. And even, even outside of Jerusalem uh, and Judea, more than likely, Greek was more favorable to anybody, even Jewish people, not necessarily Gentiles. Um, now let's look a little bit more at the book of Acts uh, as far as the text goes. Uh, and again, uh, chapter one, um, we find this promise of the Holy Spirit's coming. And, and as one of my former professors and undergraduate used to say, it's not Acts of the Apostles, it's Acts of the Holy Spirit. And on, on you know, seriousness, because the Holy Spirit is the main character in many ways in the book of Acts. But again, going back to chapter one on the right side, you notice the highlighted portion where Jesus commissions his um, disciples to go out. There's this notion of them going out from their backyards, or at least where they were at the moment, to the greater country, or at least not maybe state, for a modern analogy, uh, to the greater region, to the greater world. Um, is something to think about. And of course, there's a replacement for uh, Judas uh, Matthias. And we also find in chapter two um, an upper room experience where these apostles go to the upper room um, and they they have this Holy Spirit come upon them. Um, this this uh, flaming tongues notion, uh, this this fire, uh, the Holy Spirit's given to them, and some denominations use this as this notion of you know the Holy Spirit coming to a Christian. They're quote unquote saved and the Holy Spirit comes upon them later. They're, they're uh, sanctified later, if you will. And of course, Baptist theology, it's a little different, but uh, there's some denominations that do buy into that. But uh, we find over in chapter two, um, over on the left side here, this is the NIV, this notion of the um, Pentecost. It's, a, it's a Jewish, essentially a Jewish holiday. Um, and it's a time where people were coming in from all over the empire, at least uh, the, the different areas, uh, Jewish people would come to the temple and worship. Um, 
you know, almost like a pilgrimage, if you will. Uh, there's pilgrimage been throughout history, especially in uh, uh, Jewish circles, Islamic circles, pilgrimages to Mecca, early Christian circles, especially in early history, there are a lot of pilgrimages to the Holy Land. There were uh, early maps, uh, you know, around the time of Constantine. Constantine's mother was big on these journeys to the Holy Land. Uh, anyway. People still today, especially evangelical Christians, love to travel to Jerusalem and Bethlehem, etc. But anyway, so there's pilgrimage going on. There's people in town that weren't necessarily always lived there. Um, so chapter 2, uh, verse 2, suddenly a, a sound like a blowing wind, a violent wind came from heaven to fill the whole house. They were sitting there and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit enabled them. So one of the things we'll find here in this passage is this miracle of the tongues, this, this, this gift of the Holy Spirit, if you will, in the text. And there's a question of this, this glossolalia is the, is the Greek term there. Is this glossolalia, is it the miracle of them actually being able to speak these other languages or is it a miracle of the, of the people being actually able to hear them? And one of the, one of the things we find in 1 Corinthians is this notion of glossolalia as well there people speaking in tongues as, as, as an outpouring of the Spirit. Um, but one thing to keep in mind when you read Acts 2 and you read 1 Corinthians and you see this notion of glossolalia, one thing to keep in mind is uh, it may not be this modern notion of glossolalia that you find in some of these uh, charismatic Christian denominations. The, the gibberish, uh, some would call it, or the, the sounds, uh, the the spirit language, if you will, some call it that. Um, this seems, at least in the book of Acts, this seems to be either speaking another language, a, a known language, or being able to understand or hear uh, this other language. Um, we find here in chapter uh, 2, verse 5, and they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Uh, when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, are all these uh, who are speaking Galileans, uh, the backwards country folk, if you will? Uh, now how is it each of us hears our own native language? So we've got these country boys. How in the world are they sophisticated? How in the world do they know how to speak this language? You know, they are a native language. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites. Uh, you know, this notion... Parthia, Medes, uh, Elamites, especially Parthians and Medes, think uh, modern-day Iran, that direction, the, the, the uh, west of Judea and Jerusalem. Residents of Mesopotamia, uh, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, the Turkey, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, uh, modern Turkey, uh, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, so the southern Mediterranean, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them. They had too much wine to drink. In other words, they drunk. That's what some people were saying. But of course, we know they weren't drunk. There's this notion in the text of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Of course, Peter gives this great sermon. There's a lot of converts. Um, and the book of Acts uh, goes on to talk a good bit about the uh, this, this conversion, this great revival, if you will, because of this Holy Spirit outpouring. And then we find also in the text this um, life of the community, uh, this unity, again, we talked about earlier in the introductory material. Uh, we look down to chapter um, 2, verse 42, and I'm scrolling down here to that, because my computer is slow as molasses. Okay. Chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to teaching apostles and, and oh, there we go, and to the fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All believed, uh, excuse me, all believers were together and had everything in common as koinonia. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple. Courts, again, this notion of furthering of the Jewish tradition, because again, they're good Jews. Even though the Christians are good Jews, um, there is not, not a split yet as far as the text goes. But <clears throat> they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad hearts and sincere, glad sincere hearts, praising God, and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily uh, who were being saved. 
So that's a pretty big important notion there as far as the community there. And we find some uh, healings going on. Uh, Peter uh, heals a blame ble a beggar, and, and there's a sermon in Solomon's Porch, chapter 3. John and Peter go before the Sanhedrin. This tension in Judaism starts welling up in chapter 4. And again, this, this emphasis there on that tension may be uh, more so a, uh, a commentary on the time of the writing of Luke, Acts, more so than just the, the right, uh, more so than just um, the time of Peter and John, although it more than likely happened. There seems to be some tension going on here. But uh, look over here on the left side in uh, chapter four here. Um, let me get this. All believers were one heart minus again another one of those unity passages here. All believers were one heart in mind. No one claimed that any possession was their own. Uh, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus with God's grace. And uh, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Uh, there was no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned uh, land or houses sold them, uh, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to anyone who had need. Uh, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas. Uh, which means son of encouragement. Um, notice here that there's different names here. Um, Barnabas there is mentioned in, in Acts 9-11, uh, chapter nine, chapters 9 and chapters 11, chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 9-6, Galatians 2. Um, notice this notion of two names. Um, we find this with Paul too. There's a, a Jewish name, Josephus, uh, and then we find a more of a Greek name, Barnabas, um, uh, at least a Jewish size name, I guess you could say, even though it's not so a Jewish name, I mean a Greek name, excuse me. But Paul seems to have two names here. Uh, uh, we find later in the text of where he's called Saul. Um, early part, especially when he's in Jerusalem and, and stuff, but when he starts going out on missions to more Gentile areas, he's called Paul. And this is not this notion, and I'll talk about later, that it's not this notion where Paul becomes saved by Jesus and he becomes Paul. No, it's just he had a Jewish name and a Gentile name. It's, very functional. And uh, if I don't forget, I'll share a story about a guy I went to college with, Billy from China, whose actual name was not Billy, not even close to Billy. Uh, anyway, but there's this notion uh, of the, this notion of common ownership, common uh, sacrifice, koinonia, Ananias and Sapphira, interesting story about this man and his wife who um, they uh, <laughs> don't, uh, they kept some money for themselves. They sold land, they kept money for themselves. And essentially, they lie and God strikes them down. It's Acts chapter 5. It's a rather interesting story, um, kind of troubling, if you will. Uh, but it is in the text, so it's something to wrestle with. Uh, some more miracles in the latter half of 5. Um, there's uh, the apostles come before the council of the Jews in chapter 5, 17 through 42. And then it becomes more of a wider witness uh, of these, these Hellenists, these uh, converts, if you will, these, uh, or excuse me, these Jews from outside of, uh, natively outside of Jerusalem. So these Jewish men who have roots in Greco-Roman areas, and if you'll notice here in chapter 6, and we'll highlight uh, verse 5 there, because once you look at those names, we'll get, to get there. Uh, but now those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenist, Hellenist uh, these um, Jews who um, were originally from outside of Palestine, uh, Judea, um, Complain about the Hebrews, so it's got this tension between those who uh, have always been there. The family has roots in Judea, type thing. This, you know, we're the Jew, we're the Jewish Jews, the Judean Jews, and those, those Hellenists, those Jews from out of state, I guess you could say. Um, I mean, an analogy may be those uh, Southerners versus Yankees. You know, those Yankees come down to stay; they don't go away. Blah blah blah. I mean, you, you might could you get the point. Anyway, there's tension going on here. Uh, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their, their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. So there's some internal practical conflict going on here. The 12 called together the whole community of disciples and said, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God to wait on tables. So this, the apostles, the 12, um, their emphasis was on this notion of preaching, uh, teaching the word of God. Uh, but there's more practical notions that need to be taken care of. So I said, verse three, therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom. Notice that notion here, full of the spirit, whom we may appoint to this task. Uh, 
um, uh, while uh, we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and serving the word. So a lot of Baptists traditionally have gone to this passage saying, hey, these are the first deacons, the table waiters, the servants. A deacon is essentially the table waiter, servant. Uh, what they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit together with Philip, um, uh, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Permanus, Nicholas, Nicolaus, uh, proselyte of Antioch. So these all these names are very Greek. Um, these are definitely Hellenists. These are these are those men who uh, had these roots. Uh, had family may have lived, and they may have been born outside of Palestine. In fact, one of them was a Jewish convert, Nicolaus. Um, they had these men stand before the apostles, and he prayed. They who prayed and laid their hands on them, and the word of God continued to spread. Uh, the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So I mentioned Baptist. Um, for those who aren't Baptists, come from different traditions, especially those like a Methodist tradition. Um, deacon in a Baptist context is a lay leader uh, who does they do who do a lot of the practical aspects of ministry. Uh, a lot of churches have a deacon ministry where the uh, they may go visit shut-ins or uh, you know may help out practical visits or helping others and practical needs and a, a minister gives, it frees up the minister to do more time the pastor to do more time as far as uh, preaching and teaching and maybe do some hosp you know, hospital visits things like that but anyway so you know as a Baptist it's near and dear to my heart now we find also in chapter 6 we find the rest of Stephen uh, Stephen is arrested in 6 here he's a man full of grace um, he goes before the council uh, in chapter uh, 7, especially uh, 2 through 53, he goes before this council and he's tried. This is a Jewish Sanhedrin, if you will. Um, he essentially recounts Jewish history. Talks about patriarchs, talks about Joseph, talks about Abraham, talks about Egypt, all this stuff. And essentially he tells them that they have been disobedient against God. So this is, Again, this tension between Judaism, especially the Sanhedrin, uh, Palestinian Judaism, and God. And I'm scrolling through here. Um, you know, in verse 51, for example, you stiff-necked people and circumcised in hearts and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. Now you become his betrayers and murderers. You're the ones that receive the law as, or, as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. So again, this tension between Palestinian Judaism and Judaism and Christianity uh, over this Jesus. Uh, now again, this, this says something about the time of Stephen. It also says something about the time of the writing of the book of Acts. The, the, the tensions were at a boil. It seemed to be around 70 AD. Uh, you know, in fact, Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr. Now, We'll get to the book of Revelation, we'll find the word martyr a little more, a little more prevalent. But essentially, martyr in the Greek means witness, uh, giving a testimony, um, you know, somebody telling a truth. Uh, we find in, in, the, in the book of Acts, as well as the book of Revelation, it seems to be this notion of one giving their testimony or a witness, like a, a court witness type thing. Um, and Stephen tells about Jesus, that there seems to be some persecution, at least in Acts and Revelation, there seems to be persecution or martyrdom in the modern context associated with that giving of the witness. Uh, Stephen is stoned. He, he's, he's stoned. In fact, uh, we find here in verse 58 of chapter 7, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, and the witnesses lay their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Uh, and then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold, hold this against him. And when he said this, he died, and Saul approved of their killing. So this is the first mention of Saul, this Paul fella, we find, come into the story. Uh, and, of course, uh, chapter 8, Saul begins to persecute the church. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, he's, a, he's zealous for Judaism. We, we find that he's zealous for the systems that are in place, fair sacral Judaism, I guess you could say. Um, he's zealous for that. And Paul even talks about his, his uh, Jewish credentials in his writings. But we find an interlude here in chapter 4, verse 4, especially in other places, we find this witness of Philip. This one of these guys was one of the table waiters. He has missions in Samaria, which was a no-no for most good Jewish men. 
a Palestinian Jewish man. Uh, and we find he, he has this incident with an Ethiopian eunuch. So you know how I mentioned there's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Well, this is part of the ends of the earth starting coming in here because uh, this man, this Ethiopian eunuch, which uh, I think maybe Castrati or something like that, um, you know, this, this man was, his, uh, his um, ability to procreate was taken away from him. He, this Ethiopian eunuch, um, and this is not uncommon in some uh, courts for eunuchs to be, um, I mean, hey, eunuchs to serve a queen or serve a court. Uh, they were deemed uh, uh, sometimes more reliant, more faithful, um, and, uh, you know, they, they couldn't mess around, <laughs> especially with, this, with a queen. They couldn't mess around with a queen. But anyway, uh, they were some ways held in high regard, but they were sometimes viewed as other as different, as inferior, because they weren't able to pre reproduce, and there's a bit of a stigma in some ways. Uh, but the kingdom is extends to this Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, so the angel of the Lord said to Philip, "Get up and go toward the south again." So the spirit, this God, is prompting uh, these people to go to different places, and he goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, just down the road, a wilderness road, no nowhere, I guess you could say, maybe. There was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of the entire treasury. So this man was a man of standing. Um, he had come to Jerusalem to worship, so he's probably a God-fearer or the proselyte, maybe. maybe. Uh, anyway, and he was returning home, and see, which, by the way, since he was a eunuch, he couldn't uh, go to certain areas of the temple because he, was, um, he wasn't uh, richly whole enough. In, in Old Testament uh, Torah type notions of holiness, just like a women uh, couldn't go into certain areas men could go into, just like especially women menstruating couldn't even go to, really to the temple. This man couldn't go to certain areas of the temple to worship properly because of his eunuch status. Um, anyway, uh, he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning home and seated in his chair. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. So this man is, is probably an upper crust type person. He's head of the treasury. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Most people couldn't read. Remember, maybe 10% of the population in ancient Palestine could read. Uh, excuse me, ancient Roman world, I should say. Now, it might be a little bit higher with Judaism, with emphasis on text, especially Torah. And, but for the most part, most people couldn't read. And not only that, but actual text, scrolls, were expensive. So this guy had some means about him. So he's reading the prophet Isaiah. Uh, which is an individual scroll. He wouldn't have had a code to see a, a, a spine-bound book like we had today. The Spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. Again, the Spirit is prompting, Holy Spirit is prompting Philip to do this. So Philip ran up to it and heard the reading of the prophet Isaiah, and he asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? He invited Philip to, go, to get in and sit beside him. So this notion, and this is kind of, self-serving here for me, but, you know, it's easy to pick up the Bible and say, hey, this is what the text reads, but sometimes you need some guidance from those who were learned uh, or guided correctly by God to help interpret the text. It's so easy to pick up a text. The Bible tells me this. It's like the old joke about a Baptist. You get five Baptists in a room reading a piece of scripture, and you get about 30 different opinions of what it means. Um, so, you know, that's an old joke, and it kind of does poke a little bit of uh, problem of truth. Uh, the truth there is that sometimes we get misguided. Uh, anyway, he invited Philip to sit beside him, and, and the scripture passage of the reading was like this. Like sheep, he was led to the slaughter, like a uh, lamb silent before its shearer, uh, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice uh, was denied him. Who can describe this generation uh, for his life is taken away from the earth? So, you know, here's the passage. Uh, an Old Testament passage uh, that is interpreted to apply to Jesus. The Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does this prophet say this, about himself or someone else? So, again, the Holy Spirit, the right moment, right time, allowed to open the door. And Peter began to speak. And starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus Christ. As they were going down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What does prevent me from being baptized? Uh, and of course, notice in, in the uh, NRSV here on the right side, it goes from verse 36 to verse 38, and we should have a footnote there if it'll come up. 37 is missing. 
verse 37. Uh, essentially, there's a lot of the ancient manuscripts. Um, see, all other ancient authorities add all or most of verse 37. So some of the oldest, most reliable manuscripts, according to textual critical scholars, don't have 37. They believe 37 is an insertion. Um, and as verse 37 reads, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This notion of profession of faith for baptism. Now for Baptist, and our, our mode of believer's baptism, that verse is pretty important. But again, it may not be the oldest. It, might not, it may not be uh, original to the text. Uh, again, we talked about this uh, the woman called adultery and over in the Gospel of John, uh, you know, some of these uh, passages like that, there's different passages that may not be original. Uh, they're, they're not found in some of the oldest texts, so they may or may not be original. So that's why it's a footnote there. Uh, I mean, even the ending of Mark, a similar type of thing. Uh, it may not be original. That's why you have all these different footnotes in these modern translations. But of course, the KJB and these older translations include it. Uh, he commanded him to stop the chariot. Both them, Philip and the eunuch, went down to the water and he baptized him. Um, baptism isn't just something Christians did. Uh, uh, bat baptism occurred with John the Baptist. Baptism occurred in the Dead Sea Scroll community. And in, in fact, there were things in Judaism for baptism uh, as mechanisms. Uh, but in fact, in Qumran, it was a ritual cleansing thing. Uh, it seems to be an initiation rite in early Christianity. Um, you know, uh, almost like if you, uh, you're a Mason or something, you know, the secret handshake type thing. You know, well, you join the club. Somebody showed me a secret handshake. Uh, in fact, when I baptized my son, my oldest son, nine-year-old, I made the comment to him. I was like, but it's like a secret handshake. I told you, you're part of the club now. You're part of a church. It's your initiation right into this organization. When it came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went away rejoicing. Philip found himself at uh, as Otis, and he was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So this, wow, I just... Stole him away. Anyway, we find uh, Paul's conversion in chapter 9. Now, the, you know, it's often labeled as Paul's conversion, but um, it's not necessarily Paul rejecting Judaism and becoming a Christian. It's just that he, it's almost like he changes denominations. Let's put it that way. He, he gets to meet the, the, the real true Lord Jesus. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Paul uh, in a little bit uh, as far as his missionary journeys and a little bit about his letters and things like that. What do we know about Paul? But let's look at this story, this uh, notion of uh, <clears throat> his uh, changing from persecutor to being the persecutor, I guess you could say. Uh, <clears throat> meanwhile, Saul, again, his Jewish name, Saul, still breathing uh, threats and, and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to synagogue in Damascus, said if he found any who belonged to the way. Now the way is the name that Christians initially started using for themselves. Uh, not Christians. Christian was a derogatory term we'll find mentioned uh, called Jew, uh, Gentiles called Christians. Um, or at least the Gentile areas called Christians later. But they called themselves the way. Men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, he was, I'm looking at verse 3, chapter 9. Now, he was going along and approaching Damascus. Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, he asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice and but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and, and though his eyes were open, he could not see, he could see nothing. So he led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Again, three days. Three, see that you think? Three days, Jesus in death and resurrection, things like that. Three is a good holy number. Anyway, now the disciples in Damascus, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said then in vision, Ananias. Again, the, these miraculous acts of God in, in the lives of his disciples. Um, the vision, right? That's very Old Testament. It happens some of the gospel, the early part of the gospels, you know, the angels appearing to Joseph, but a vision is a very Old Testament type thing. He answered, here I am, Lord, uh, which is, I mean, I think about that, here I am, Lord, very reminiscent of Isaiah chapter six, right? 
you know, here am I, send me. Um, anyway, the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Uh, at this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and slay his hands on him that he might regain his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done uh, to your saints in Jerusalem. He has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. So, yeah, he's killing people. Should I go see him? 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the, peop uh, before the people of Israel. Um, I myself will show him how he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house and his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, uh, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately the scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored he got up and was baptized again um, we baptist um, practice believers baptism he, be he believes in jesus christ professes him initiation right is his baptism this cleansing away of the washing with the old and welcoming the new uh, and after that took some food to regain his strength preaches in damascus uh, he has to be paul has to, or saul has to be let down in a basket to escape Damascus because he stirred up stuff. They tried to, some people tried to kill him. He goes to Jerusalem. He attempted to join disciples. They were all afraid of him for they did not believe he was a disciple. Verse 26, verse 27. But Barnabas took him. Barnabas popped up earlier. Brought him to the apostles and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord. I mean, it's, it's spoken to him. And how, <coughs> excuse me, in Damascus he had uh, spoken bodily in the name of Jesus. Or boldly, excuse me. Lord, I mercy, can't read boldly in the name of Jesus. He went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, but they were attempting to kill him. The believers learned of it. They brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord, comfort of the Holy Spirit, that increased in numbers. So we find Peter in uh, Lydda and Joppa, uh, chapter 9, Peter and Cornelius is a great story. In, in Acts chapter 10, this notion of uh, opening up a food, um, you know, uh, this vision of Paul on the rooftop, and there's this blanket come down, these different animals, and, you know, God says, you know, in verse, voice here in verse 13, get up and kill and eat. And Peter responds, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that's profane and unclean. These are unclean animals uh, that you good Jews weren't supposed to eat. And uh, essentially, this vision is in encouraging Paul or Peter to go out to the Gentiles, like Cornelius, a centurion. Um, you know, God's opening up the gospel to these Gentiles, uh, especially as a God-fearing man, as Cornelius, who's already receptive probably to the ways of God. Um, so the Gentiles hear the good news from Peter. Um, the Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit there in, in that passage. And then Peter reports to Jerusalem. Uh, in chapter 11, and scroll through here, Church of Antioch. Now, Christians are first called Christians at Antioch. Um, but notice here, verse 28, one of them named Agabus stood up and predicted the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, excuse me, uh, there would be a severe famine all the world, and this took place during the reign of Claudius. Uh, so we have a note there of this time frame, Claudius. Uh, you know, Jews were expelled from Rome uh, around that time. Anyway, uh, verse 25. Notice there that Saul is still called Saul. It's not until he begins his first missionary journey. Essentially, he started becoming called Paul. James is killed in chapter 12. Peter's in prison. Uh, James, the brother of John, is killed. Excuse me, not James, the brother of Jesus. Old uh, camel knees because supposedly he was so pious in prayer. His knees, you know, his knees, his knees were... Uh, like uh, swollen, like almost like camel's knees. Um, now, Acts chapter 13 is where uh, Barnabas and Saul are commissioned. Uh, they're they're given this call to go out. Uh, now, in the church at uh, Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, called Serene, uh, Manan, a member of the court of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping 
uh, the Lord in fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after the fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So um, even the word apostle itself uh, is, is a notion of a, 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 someone who is commissioned and sent to go deliver a message. That's a, kind of a secular notion of apostle. Uh, I jokingly call it uh, God's uh, divine EPS man, I guess you could say. They're, you know, God's mail, you know, uh, commissioned mail carrier. These apostles are supposed to go out and to um, share the message uh, to others. So Paul, uh, especially the, the disciples, go off and, and they preach. Um, so we find that Paul and Barnabas uh, go out and notice that uh, this time as Paul is commissioned, he is starting... Now, verse 9 here, but Paul, as chapter 13, verse 9, but Paul also, I mean, Saul, verse, also known as Paul, filled the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you are son of the devil, talking to Simon of our Jesus. And notice this is Paul going out on his first commission trip, I guess you could say. Uh, and this is um, at Cyprus. This is a very Gentile area. So Paul's Gentile name starts popping up. You know, Paul and Barnabas, Antioch's uh, Pisidia. Now, another important passage that we'll talk about eventually uh, is Acts chapter 15, um, and that'll pop up a little bit in the discussion of Paul, especially in Galatians 2. Um, but let's go a little bit over it right now and just mention um, the uh, debate over the acceptance of Gentiles. So again, chapter 15 is this notion of um, as the... the new sect of Judaism starts expanding, as Christianity starts expanding, they start going to the Gentile areas. Well, what do we do with Gentiles? Do Gentile converts, do they become Jewish first? Do they stay, I mean, can they stay essentially Jewish and not get circumcised, etc.? cetera? Um, so there's this big conference in Jerusalem, kind of the home church and mother church, I guess you could say. Uh, the apostles and the elders met together, verse six here in chapter 15, um, to consider this matter. Uh, and they had much debate. Peter stood up and said, And my brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. This is an echo back <coughs> to the, the P Peter and Cornelius, this notion of the lowering of the unclean animals. Anyway, God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he made no distinction between them and us. Uh, again, that notion that Peter and Cornelius was uh, unclean God can make clean type notion. Now, therefore, why are you putting God uh, to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we would be able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. So the whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told them the signs and wonders that God had done uh, through them among the Gentiles. After they finished uh, speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Uh, Simeon, Paul, uh, Peter's other name, uh, was, has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophet. And there's this uh, quote there. Um, therefore, verse 19, therefore I have reached a decision that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. We should write to them to abstain. This is the requirements, okay? Entry into Christianity from the Gentiles only requires the things, the things we're required to do, no circumcision, is to abstain from things polluted by idols. In other words, you know, a lot of Greco-Roman cities, the, uh, there'd be a lot of times animals would be sacrificed, or at least meat when it was, uh, Animals were killed. It was dedicated to an idol and then fed to the people, especially some of these guild meetings. Uh, you'd find that uh, the meat fed uh, people at these guild meetings, these, these kind of conventions, parties, things like that. Um, they've been sacrificed and dedicated to a pagan god. So abstain for those meats. And Paul, this issue pops up in Paul about eating unclean uh, meat, things like that, things offered to idols. And for fornication. Uh, so any sexual activity outside the bonds of marriage is essentially this kind of archaic word fornication. Uh, so what's the old joke? No ding ding without the wedding ring. Uh, from whatever has been strangled and from blood. So some of this notion of strangling and from blood, uh, 
Um, this kind of goes back some of the purity laws in the Old Testament, I think, a little bit. But for in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. Okay, so there's, there's a letter to the Gentile believers. This is a pretty important uh, notion uh, in the early church. Now, let's take a little bit of a, a break here as far as me, and we'll stop the video, and I'll restart here in just a moment. We'll talk a little bit more about the life of Paul.